Welcome to online worship at Portland Avenue United Methodist Church in Bloomington, Minnesota. We are observing Maundy Thursday tonight as we commemorate the supper Jesus shared with his disciples before his crucifixion. My name is Carol Zagsma, pastor here at the port, and I'm pleased to be joined by Jill Means, pastor at Hillcrest United Methodist, and Jerry Jensen, minister of education and pastoral support at Hillcrest United Methodist Church. We extend a warm welcome to you for tonight's joint worship service. From busy weekday lives, we pause this hour, gathered as friends, to remember Jesus' last earthly night with his disciples. May we listen for God's invitation to personal discipleship and service, to communion with one another and with the Holy One, despite the physical and virtual distance between us. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. I believe in the sun. I invite you to join together in our opening prayer. Holy God, remind us on this special day of the many ways that we know you. 
We know you as a strong deliverer, a humble servant, as one who bids us to love one another, that the world might know you. Lead us not only to the beauty of your solitary reflection, but also to your community. As we remember together your words and your example, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Our opening scripture acknowledges that Passover in the days of the temple in Jerusalem is a historical framework from which we journey through Holy Week. This is a story as told in Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole Israeli Israelite community. On the 10th day of this month, they must take a lamb for each household, a lamb for each house. If the household is too small for a lamb, it should share one with a neighbor nearby. You should divide the lamb into proportion of the number of people who will be eating it. This is how you should eat it. You should be dressed with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. You should eat the meal in a hurry. It is the Passover of the Lord. I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night and I'll strike every, down every oldest child in the land of Egypt. I am that I am. I am the Lord. The blood shall be on your sign on the houses where you live. Wherever I see that blood, I will pass over you. No plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day will be a day of remembrance for you. You will observe it as festive to the Lord. You will observe it in every generation as a regulation for all time. And please join me in our scripture reading this evening, which comes from John 13, 1 through 30, and we will be using the CEB translation. Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian in the first century, and he writes that on Passover, the population of Jerusalem swelled to more than 2 million as Jews made their pil pilgrimage from the temple for their annual celebration of Israel's liberation from slavery in Egypt. Ancient pilgrims had to be in the city no later than seven days before the beginning of the feast. This is the environment in which the last days of Jesus' life took place. Hear these words from the gospel, the gospel of John chapter 13. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had to come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robes, picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into the washburn and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, 
you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Jesus responded, those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. That's why he said, not every one of you. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. And he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash the feet of each other. I have given you an example, just as I have done, you must also do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are set greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those whom I've chosen. But this is to fulfill the scripture. The one who eats my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will still believe that I am. I assure you that whatever and whoever receives someone I sent receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After he said these things, Jesus was deeply disturbed and testified. I assure you, one of you will betray me. His disciples looked at each other, confused about which one of them he was talking about. One of the disciples who Jesus loved was at Jesus' side. Simon Peter nodded to him to get him to ask Jesus who he was talking about. Leaning back towards Jesus, this disciple asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread once I have dipped it into the bowl. Then he dipped the piece of bread and gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. After Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. No one sitting at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Jesus told him, go buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So when Judas took the bread, he left immediately, and it was night.
We now pick up where our last scripture reading ended. Jesus knew what was yet to come. He had shared a final meal with his disciples, and he had predicted the betrayal by Judas. Now he settles in for a teaching that brings us the name Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy is derived from the Latin word manditum, which means commandment. So here's the rest of our story, which includes the greatest commandment as told in John chapter 13. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, now the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify the son of man in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will look for me, but just as I told the Jewish leaders, I also tell you now, where I'm going, you can't come. I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Here at the port during the six Sundays in Lent, we have been exploring the topic of love using the Bible in Bishop Michael Curry's book entitled Love is the Way. Bishop Curry is the first African-American presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church elected in 2015. You may remember him from his sermon at the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Bishop Curry has guided us on a journey to explore what love is in the context of our faith and whether or not love can have an impact or really change the world. Throughout this series, we have been challenged by Jesus' teaching on the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we've learned along the way, God's way of love is not always easy work. Jesus would surely say as much on that night so long ago, a night which began by Jesus washing his disciples' feet and then sharing a meal with them. But as the evening wore on, Jesus predicted the denial and betrayal of two of his disciples, and then he ultimately was arrested. God's way of love amid betrayal denial, and even leading to Jesus' death. Love is not always easy work. To this realization about love, tonight we'll add some insights from William Willimon's book entitled Fear of the Other. He's retired bishop of the North Alabama Conference of the United Methodist Church and professor at Duke Divinity School. Willimon asserts that there is no fear in love. What comes naturally, Willimon writes, is fear of the other. What's not natural is to view the other as brother or sister. Maybe that's why Jesus spends so much time teaching about who our neighbor is and then commanding us to love them just as we love ourselves. In fact, Willimon thinks of church as not only where we learn about love, but as a complement to that, church is also schooling 
in how we manage our fears. While it isn't wrong to fear, fear can sometimes lead us to do the wrong thing. So our task here at church, according to Willimon, is to learn how to fear the right things in the right way, and then how not to fear the wrong things in the wrong way. Let's look at that again. Here at church, we are to learn how to fear the right things the right way and how not to fear the wrong things the wrong way. Willimon explains this by saying, our problem in regard to fear is that we fear the other more than we fear the God who commands us to love one another. Jesus commands us to love each other. So, Willimon says, love your neighbor as yourself cannot mean love your neighbor as if your neighbor were you. Loving your neighbor instead means to love your poor black or your rich white, Jewish, Muslim, NRA conservative Republican, class-hating Democrat, atheist, homophobic, exuberantly lesbian neighbor. Love them all as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Act toward the other as Jesus has acted toward you. Jesus pushes us not only to accept our neighbor, but actually to love them. The welcome we offer is to be nothing short of love. And yes, sometimes that is a really hard thing to do. Because love is not always easy work. But as Willimon suggests, asking God to give us the grace To receive the other is an essential first step on that journey. Asking God to give us the grace to receive the other is an essential first step on the journey to love. So now that we're at this point, I want to leave you with this imagery described by Willimon. When we say God, we are not indicating some being who resembles us and our values, yet much more perfectly. No, God actually is other. When we are talking about and attempting to listen to God, we are not simply expressing some of our personal notions about deity. We are in conversation with one who is other, a stranger who is in dialogue with us, interacting with us, revealing to us without lessening the sheer otherness. You see, when we speak to God, We are not in a monologue. We are not just talking to an idealized projection of ourselves. We are in dialogue, not only speaking, but also listening between ourselves and an other. And what we find by that conversation is that it is risky because we may be transformed in the dialogue. We might hear things that we could never have said to ourselves. This is most certainly true of our conversations with God. But you know what? This is also true with our conversations with others. So essentially, we are called to be in dialogue with God as well as with all the other others. Willimon explains that he takes this step forward willingly while opening his arms He does this not because of a supernatural or enlightened understanding of the other. No, he does it because, he says, of Jesus' redefinition of me. Embracing other because of Jesus' redefinition of me. Tonight, as we gather around Christ's communion table, may we be transformed by a dialogue with God while completely opening our hearts to Jesus' redefinition within us. For that is what is going to enable us to replace our fear of the other with the love of God. So may it be so. Amen.
My sisters and brothers, God shows us his love by becoming a humble servant. Let us draw near to God and confess our sins in the truth of God's spirit. Please join me. Most merciful God, we, your church, conf confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ. Where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him. Forgive us, we pray. And by your spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment for your brief, silent confession. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. But Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead and ascended on high for us. And he continues to intercede for us. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion, please know that you are not required to be a member of Portland Avenue or Hillcrest United Methodist Churches or any United Methodist Church to receive communion this evening. Jesus Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So may we now join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is a right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, heaven on earth and creator of both. From the earth you bring forth bread and you create the fruit of the vine. You formed us into your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You feed us manna in the wilderness and grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth, all the company in heaven, we praise your name and join in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be filled. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to his church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ, given for you. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ, given for you. Amen. Now let us join together in the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
concludes our Monday Thursday worship service. We hope you'll tune in again tomorrow night online for a joint Good Friday worship service or Sunday morning for online Easter worship prepared individually by each of our congregations. Hillcrest United Methodist Church will be online at 9.30 a.m. and Portland Avenue United Methodist Church at 10 a.m. Now, hear these words as a blessing. Go in peace. Make Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you this night and forever. Amen.